you read stories of the girls answer an ad that they're going to be house cleaners and they end up chained in a basement. It, it's always about economic mobility. It's yeah. always about they think they're taking a job. And then the kidnapping is inadvertent because they're getting in the car. But what they don't realize is that the payment was fraudulent. Yeah. Or the contract was a lie. So there's yeah. always also the, the optics of consent now. Mm-hmm. doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. And you are very welcome and also forewarned to join us today for our Colonizers World Tour, continuing coverage and discussion of Brazil in the month of April 2022. And we are in our week looking at slavery and racism as a sub-theme. And our piece of art for this week is the 2021 Netflix film Seven Prisoners. Um, yes. So it is the story of modern uh, slavery uh, in, in a specific uh, junkyard in Sao Paulo. Um, we meet at the beginning of the film four young men from a very uh, rural area who are excited about this new work opportunity that they're going on. Um, and they are you know, collected in a van and taken to this junkyard in, in Sao Paulo and uh, very quickly realize that they are slaves, basically. They think that they're working to get paid. Then they are told by uh, Luca, who is their overseer, that they have to first pay off their debt before they can make any money. And, and their debt is what is part of what was paid in advance to their families. Yes. So... If Luca ever, ever the businessman gives them an itemized list of their debt. Um, and the main p p character uh, and focus of this is a young man named Mateus. Uh, we see him first with his family. We don't necessarily see the other families of the other young men. Um, but Mateus lives uh, in a very rural area with his mother and two sisters. And he is going up for this opportunity, this work opportunity, to help alleviate the the stress that his mother is under being a farm laborer for her whole life. Um, they're very impoverished. They struggle for resources, for food, for adequate housing. And so he is taking this opportunity to go work for a while, but he also has bigger plans of becoming uh, an engineer and his going to college and his family knows that. Uh, and he is the lens through which we we kind of see this whole story unfold. Um, and he is the one that realizes very quickly what's happening. He can read, he can do basic maths, um, and he has the, that capability of, of critical thinking that some of the other young men um, don't have. Uh, they didn't finish school, etc. They don't know how to read. Um, and so he is the one to figure out what's happening to them. And then the story is the series of uh, quasi choices he is forced to make in order to survive. And it is one of the most brutally honest and heartbreaking stories we've encountered on Colonizers World Tour and we've encountered a lot. Um, so I won't say any more about our dear Mateus or even uh, Luca, who does not become our dear Luca, but we gain a lot more empathy for throughout the film. Uh, Dr. Kristen, what would you like to talk about with Seven Prisoners? I mean, there's part of me that just wants to say, if you have freedom of movement and choice in your life, be grateful mm. and end the video. Um, 
because the reality is if we chase this out are so paralyzing. Yeah, it really so one is. Of the, one of the things that we learn is that their labor, essentially their slavery, their, their slave labor is part of the electrical grid of the city. And I can guarantee you that no one paying their electrical bill in Sao Paulo knows that it's being provided by slave labor. But then even if they did learn, what would they do about it? Mm. Because if it's anything like Philadelphia, there are not alternative energy opportunities. If I want power in my house, I have Pico. That's it. And if I want power in my house, I also don't want to look too closely at how I'm getting that power. Mm. And that's the story of Seven Prisoners. Is yeah. that this is all how the world works now. And when I say now, I mean always has. And so the true gut punch for me was the delusion we have all lived under that slavery ever ended. Yeah. And it's really easy for us to, in the United States, to then make the argument like, well, no, it didn't end. It just, the 13th Amendment means it went to, and that's true. But there are also folks who are right now being trapped in basements in the United States that are being trafficked, that are selling their body against their will for food, that are being... Uh, the world is terrible. Yeah. And the systems are designed that those of us who benefit from the systems never question them. And I just left this whole thing feeling like, well, what the hell do I do now? Yeah, it was, it, uh, it, it did leave me feeling very defeated. Um, for now. You know, obviously I won't live in that, but that was my, at the end of the, at the end of the film, there's kind of a, an inevitability to, to what you see. And you and I both kept expecting kind of an, Ameri like, an American, an American ending. When is someone going to rescue them? Yeah. When is someone no. going to help them? When is, uh, Mateus going to like f outsmart Luca and figure out a way to get out of this? No, the point is you can't get out of this. The movie is called Seven Prisoners. By the end of the movie, Luca does not consider Mateus a prisoner anymore. When he's asked about it, he says, no, he's like, I thought that some guy goes, I thought there were seven. He goes, no, this is, there's only six. But Mateus is, is a prisoner because he. And so is Luca. And yeah. And like, that's what you said offline. You were like, it should be called eight prisoners because by the time we get to the end of the movie, we realize, you know, Luca reveals himself to Mateus and then introduces him to the life and, and the moral compromises and, and the decisions that you make. But he says to him pretty early on, just like me, you were sold. So like, Luca worked himself up to this position where he is in a position of authority, authority and has relative freedom of choice and movement. But does he? Yeah. Because he can't just like up and go to America if he felt like it. No. And by the end of the movie, we learn that like he made all of these choices so that he could support his mother and get her out of, you know, farm laboring and poverty. And for me, you know, we, and we talked about this in our, in our slavery and racism 101 video, like slavery isn't directly, modern day slavery isn't directly about race anymore, but it is indirectly. And sometimes it is directly, but like, that's not the, the main driving focus. It's the exploitation of people who are impoverished, undereducated, under-resourced. Yeah, like nobody believes that black people's brains are smaller anymore on the whole. Right. Like the system isn't built on that belief. There are people that do. But the system is not built on the belief that they're not humans. Yeah. The system is built on the belief that their humanity doesn't matter. Right, because it can be exploited. Yeah. Um, and those, the people who are... Uh, undereducated, under-resourced, impoverished, and, and lacking in power are mostly people of color because that's the way society has functioned. 
Um, yeah. And that is the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade. And that is the legacy of colonialism, is that we still have these structures in power so that we are exploiting people and abusing people and enslaving people for their labor. Yeah. And, you know, that for me, that was uh, the way that they had constructed the system at the junkyard to take advantage of these young men because they were all of those things I just listed because some of them couldn't read because some of them never finished school because they didn't have any power uh, or any opportunity for upward mobility to leave the, the rural uh, community that they came from. I just, nor did they, yeah. it like a couple of them didn't want to leave. Yeah. And that was a, a good thing I'm glad this show showed us, like the movie showed us. Like one of them is like, I'm never going back there. Another one is like, well, my wife's there and I'm just going to the city for a couple years. I'm going to earn a bunch of money and then I'm going to go back. We're going to have three kids and I'm going to live there forever. And so it's, it's not that they were desperate to get out of a circumstance they found problematic. Yeah. They were just trying to make a living. And there, the number of times that you read stories of the girls answer an ad that they're going to be house cleaners and they end up chained in a basement, it, it's always about economic mobility. It's yeah. always about they think they're taking a job. And then the kidnapping is inadvertent because they're getting in the car. But what they don't realize is that the payment was fraudulent. Yeah. Or the contract was a lie. So there's yeah. always also the, the optics of consent now. Mm-hmm. Which just messes with your brain even more. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we talked about that with Mateus, right? Like, he makes a series of choices, but does he ever really have a choice? Because the moment, he has kind of two moments of realization. Um, the first is when he realizes that they're indentured servants, that they have to pay off, they have to work off their debt, and their debt is so high it's like three years of working. That, that they aren't going to be able to work it off. So he has that moment of realization. And then towards the end of the movie, uh, when he realizes that there was no deal, as he calls it, the deal that if they worked off their debt, they would be free. And, you know, he's having this conversation with Luca and he's, and he's, there is, there is no deal. And, I mean, I don't know what you would do the moment you realize that, like, Samuel is never going to see his wife again. Because he will yeah. spend the rest of his life in that, in that junkyard, junkyard or die. Um, and Mateus is given the option to stay at the junkyard or Luca is, you know, advancing, continuing to advance, and he can take... Mateo's with him. And the, you know, again, you can sit there and you can judge Mateo's for the choices that he makes, but does he really have a choice? So like I said, there's part of me that just wants to say, this is a great gratitude practice. That form most of us that have access to this video, this might not be a reality we ever face. And on the other hand, it's a call to empathy to remind us that even the people that we would love to paint as evil mm. are caught up in a system of exploitation themselves. And all of us are caught up in systems of control that we didn't consent to. Mm. And the best way that we can respond to it truly, because fundamentally, this is the question I get all the time. It's just asked in different ways. So what do we do once we see the system? And the best answer I have is love the person in front of you. Because at the end of the day, that's the only true choice we have. It's the only true control we have is to control our attitude and our interactions with other people. Beyond that, we don't have as many choices as we'd like to think we do. We're all limited choices. It's one of the things I wish we would stop telling kids they can be whatever they want to be. They can't. Mm -hmm. There are limitations. 
So let's stop judging people for limitations and let's start acknowledging the limitations that come within society and teaching people to become not content because I don't like that word, but have a deep understanding of who they are so they can then move the world, move through the world in their own power and consent, regardless of the choices that other people make for them. And, you know, this is why we talk about systems all the time, because we see them and we analyze them. That's what we were trained to do as social scientists. And like, I will spend the rest of my life uh, talking about them and trying to chip away at them, dismantle them, re dis deconstruct them any way that I can. Um, and sometimes it feels like Everest and sometimes it feels like Mount Washington here in Pittsburgh, which I can scale with an a incline. But like there are days when it feels like too much, but we have yeah. to keep doing it. Um, yeah. Because if we don't, then, then it just keeps perpetuating the inequality and the exploitation and the abuse and the enslavement of other people. And so it's like empathy and then action. And some, you know, there's, there's things we can't change right now. There's things we can't, like, if, as you said at the start of this, if our electrical grid was powered by uh, enslaved people, what are we going to do? Go off the electrical grid? Then how are we going to help? You know, like there are times where the choices are really difficult, but we have to know about it first before we can decide what we can do about it. So our hope for you is that you can sit with the pain of others in a way that doesn't paralyze you but motivates you to realize both gratitude and action. That there's no moral judgments in the realities of this system. Actors make the choices that they make in the moment that they're asked to make it with the best information they have at the time, just like you do. The world is shitty. And it is beautiful. And both of those things can be true at once. Next week, we're going to talk about women in Brazil. So I'm assuming the topic is not going to get any better. But we will do our best to find triumphant stories of beautiful mm. Brazilian women and across all the spectrums. And to tell you stories of triumph that in one of the world's most dangerous places to be a woman, there are women that still thrive. Mm. And we can't wait to see you then.